So, uh, what I have tried to talk so far about is trying to present uh, a picture of the complexity of the Tibetan tradition, which I summarized through these three vehicles, three yana scheme of Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. This is to give you an idea of the three layers that of Buddhist culture that made, made it to Tibet. As I said the first time, uh, one of the reason Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhism is what it is, is because of the very late date of its transmission from India, starting roughly in the middle 8th century. The other one, obviously, is the conditions of Tibetan, of Tibet and particularly Tibetan history. And the first time I ended it by talking about the conflict between Sutra and Tantra. So Hinayana and Mayana on one side and Tantra on the other side, right? And this is why I ended the first class. And last time what we did, I tried to do is to show you how the Lamrim genre of literature started by Atisha was a way for uh, Buddhist thinkers to bring some order to this complexity and to solve the conflict between Sutra and Tantra by basically establishing a, a kind of gradation in which the Sutra part of Buddhism would be the preparation and the Tantra part, the Vajrayana, would be the main practice. And I emphasize that this is essentially a pragmatic uh, uh, solution. So today what I want to talk about is obviously Tantra or Vajrayana. And uh, this is going to be, uh, this is something which I find a little bit difficult to do for many reasons. One is that it's a really deep topic because it goes to uh, the essence of the main uh, conundrum of Buddhist tradition, which is the relation between the conditioned and the unconditioned. And that's something which, that's a topic which is not easy to talk about and is a very deep conundrum. The other thing is, the other reason this is, uh, uh, so on one hand it's a deep topic. On the other hand, it's, so, it's also a strange topic as you will say today because Tantra has a lot of strange features. Now today I'm not really going to talk about the practice, what I'm going to talk is mostly what is the view behind Tantra which explains, which allows us to make sense of these weird, uh, often weird practices. And then another source of difficulty is that Tantra is secret. So uh, Tantra is not the kind of practice that is supposed to be uh, open uh, to everybody because only uh, people who have received the empowerment uh, can uh, really uh, practice Tantra. So today I'm mostly going to talk about the tantric view, the kind of view that makes sense of uh, Tantra. As always, if you have questions which are directly relevant to my topic, don't hesitate, jump in, raise, the, raise your hand if you have a question which is more kind of general that can wait until the end of the session. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. The main question of today, oh, before I, d I do that, uh, I want to encourage you to download uh, this book for next time, The Path to a Spacious Path to Freedom, particularly pages 68 to 147, because that's the pages I will go through and I will read a number of passages next time. So if you have, uh, uh, if you're re interested, that will be really helpful for you to have uh, the uh, text with you. 
Uh, this is a text of uh, Dzogchen Mahamudra, which is uh, another way to uh, accomplish what Tantra. What's that? The name of the book. It's called A Spacious Path to Freedom. We have a copy of the book, but you have to email me or George. Yeah. One or two people have it. I didn't put it on the website for all these reasons, but I can, you can mail me the book if you want it. So, so what is the link that's on the website? Those, those are various texts. These are, these are PDFs, oh. or, or, or partial PDFs. Okay. So, Tantra. <laughs> the way I presented Tantra uh, the first time, I think Joe uh, just jumped in and, tell, and told me, tell us what Tantra is. And obviously, well, wait a second, it's not easy. But the way I tried to define it is that Tantra is a way to practice the path from the point of view of the result. It's a way to practice the path as if we were already enlightened. Okay? And the question for today, uh, the question is the following. Is this sheer chutzpah or is there something real behind that idea of practicing uh, as if we were already enlightened? That's a question, right? This question is actually going to be answered differently by different Tibetan schools. Okay? So, the answer to that question is going to be, some people are going to say, yes, it's chutzpah, but it's a skillful chutzpah. And some other people are going to say, no, it's not chutzpah, because it's based on the reality of human of human being, human consciousness, call whatever you want. As you have guessed, probably, these two views uh, align with the gradualist versus the suddenist view, which I started to talk about uh, in the first class, right? I contrasted this uh, 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 two views about enlightenment, the suddenist view versus the gradualist view. Okay? Yep. <laughs> you can write. <laughs> Typically in uh, Tibetan history, that view came out uh, during the Samye debate uh, at the end of the 8th century, when Indian Buddhism was confronting uh, Chan Buddhism. And if you remember, uh, Indian Buddhism is supposed to have emerged as a victorious party, and so henceforth it is a gradualist approach which is supposed to have been privileged. The reality is actually quite different because, in a way, these are two aspects of Tibetan Buddhism that are both needed to make complete sense of the tradition. Now, uh, some schools are going to privilege the suddenist view, some other are going to privilege the gradualist, but in a way they both uh, use both. The issue, if I may remind you, is not whether enlightenment happens suddenly or gradually, because enlightenment is not something gradual, either you are enlightened or not. The issue is whether uh, enlightenment is to be discovered in us, meaning if the, the issue is whether there is in us an aspect of our uh, humanity or personality or whatever you want to talk it, of our consciousness, which is already enlightened, or that's a Sandinist view, whether enlightenment is not something that is to be found in us, but is something that you attain through uh, practice. Now, both you, uh, it's not a question whether you practice or not, but it's a question 
of what is the basis for enlightenment is the basis to be found in our mind or is the basis uh, to be attained through practice, right? Now, uh, in Tibet, the Gelupa school very strongly favored the gradualist approach, and so the answer to the question, is the idea of practicing as if one was already enlightened, this idea, the, the Geluk will say, is just sheer chutzpah. But it's a useful chutzpah, it's a great skillful means, it allows us to accomplish the path very quickly, whereas a Mayana path takes three incalculable eon, uh, Tantra is said to bring enlightenment in a single lifetime. The other view is the Nigma view, which argues, no, it's not chutzpah, because there is something in us which is, uh, has a nature of enlightenment. Some actual, not just a potential, but some actual state which has a nature of enlightenment. And this is the, the view that I'm going to pursue here, because I think that's actually the view of the tantric text themselves. Now, <laughs> so the view here, the basis of this uh, uh, tantric practice is <coughs> You can find it in this really beautiful text written by Kong Trul Rinpoche, a remade teacher of the 19th century. And basically what he's talking about is what he's talking, is what he calls continuity. So maybe we should write continuity. What's that? Uh, my question is, where does uh, Kama catch you on Sakura? They're basically all on the same side. Okay. Yeah. I, Nyingma versus Geluk, you get the clear okay. opposition. Sometimes it's a bit more complicated, uh, but... What did I want? What was I supposed to write down? Continuity. Continuity. Can I make corrections to what you're saying? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You have the whole year to correct me when I'm not here. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this idea that there is an actuality on us which is already enlightened uh, is not an idea which is new with Tantra. It's an idea which goes back to the Mahayana Sutras and even to the old basic Pali canon. So uh, I'm going to give you a couple of passages from the, one of the Mayana Sutra, which talks about uh, what's been translated in English as, as, the, as Buddha nature, and in Sanskrit it's called the Tathagata Garbha. No, 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 you have to write the Sanskrit. <laughs> this is too easy. What's Buddha nature in Sanskrit? Tata Gata Garbha. That's not the same as Buddha nature. Yes. That's a word. Tata, long A. Gata, T-H-A. Garbha, B-H-A. B-H-A. Yeah. That's the Sanskrit term that has been usually translated in English by, Tathag by Buddha nature. Uh, yes? Can I say womb? What can I say? Uh, I am going to explain. So, this is what uh, the Sutra said. Lord, the cessation of suffering is not the destruction of Dharma. Why so? Because the Dharmakaya of the Tathagata, Tathagata, the Buddha, is named cessation of suffering, and it is beginningless, uncreate, unborn, undying, 
free from death, permanent, steadfast, calm, eternal, intrinsically pure, free from all the defilement, accompanied by Buddhani uh, qualities more numerous than the sand of the Ganges, which are non-discreet, knowing as liberated and inconceivable. This Dharmakaya of the Tathagata, when not free from the defilement, is referred to as the Tathagata Garbha. So, what is this saying is that the <laughs> enlightened mind of the Buddha, <laughs> is, which is called Dharmakaya, is basically uh, the same mind that sentient being has except when at the state of sentient being that mind is covered by defilement. And then the practice is to el eliminate the defilement so as to reveal what has been always there, which is this uh, pure consciousness. <coughs> now, this is how uh, this sutra understands Buddhist practice. It takes the word tathagata and garbha is understood here as what is in the womb, meaning the embryo. Okay? So this sutra, the tathagata garbha sutra, takes it, takes that the dharmakaya already exists in us as sentient being, but is covered by defilement. That's the central idea behind this idea of continuity. That's what continuity is, is this pure mind uh, that exists already in us, which is called the Tathagata Garbha and is called the Dharmakaya when all the defilements are eliminated, right? So, as you can see, this is a suddenist view of Buddhist practice. Enlightenment is to be discovered in us. Okay? Now, what I would want to emphasize is that this was not the dominant perspective in Indian Buddhism. This sutra, which is very famous outside of India, particularly in, uh, in East Asia, was not considered very important by most Indian Buddhists up to who knows when, 7th, 8th century. So for a long time, this sutra was not considered very important. Why? Because the people understood the word garbha not as an actuality, but as a potentiality. So for them, garbha is the womb, and obviously the womb is where the embryo is produced, but it's not the embryo, right? So that was the dominant view in India prior maybe to something like the 7th, 8th century, where people uh, thought that this is not a terribly important sutra, and that if you want to use that term, you have to understand that term. You have to understand that term as uh, indicated the potentiality for Buddhahood rather than an actuality that already exists in us and has to be uncovered, discovered, and so on. This is, in fact, how the Geluk tradition understand the Tathagatagarbha as this kind of potential for Buddhahood, but not an actuality, right? So this is why the Geluk will say, no, practicing the Tantra, meaning practicing uh, from the point of view of being already enlightened, that's a great idea, but it's complete chutzpah because it's not based on anything actual existing in us. Versus the Nyingma view, which says, no, it's not chutzpah because there is in us already this kind of pure consciousness 
that is already uh, pure from defilement, but is covered by defilement, right? So that's a difference between, uh, between two interpretations of this teaching and why to the interpretation that uh, maps quite naturally onto gradualist versus suddenist. Yes? What was uh, Lord Abita's view? Uh, I, I'm not sure personally. I don't know. Uh, I don't recall anything about the Tathagata Garbha, uh, so I don't know. His whole perspective was very much a kind of gradualist perspective, but I don't know if he had a particular view about the Tathagata Garbha. Uh, you find around the, this sutra, we don't know when it comes, but probably let's say 3, 3rd, 4th century AD, maybe something like this, and around the 5th, 5th century we find it mentioned by Madhyamika authors like Chandrakirti who refute it, who say, no, this is, this is not really uh, the pure teaching. <coughs> but, but which view do they refute? The, the suddenist view of the Tathagata Garbha. The gradualist view is very much a kind of interpretation of a sutra, which is actually a suddenist sutra. Okay? Now, <laughs> as I said, you can enter the Tantra from either perspective, because if you think this is chutzpah, that's okay. It's just chutzpah that works, and that's in a way what Buddhist practice is all about. <laughs> so that's fine. Here, however, we're not in the business of practicing Tantra, but we're in the business of explaining Tantra, and so uh, as I said, I am going to side with the suddenness because the Tantra is in fact based on this idea, on this suddenness idea that there is in us a pure consciousness that already exists and that Buddhist practice is about to discover it and to eliminate the impurities that exist and covers it, right? It is this perspective which I believe uh, is at the basis of the tantras themselves. Yes? Ultimately, aren't they both practical anyway? Because even if there's a core of enlightenment, the practice of removing the defilements is going to be something gradual, is it not? Yes. That's why I said the, the issue between gradual and sudden enlightenment is not whether you need a gradation of practice, because you do, but is how you understand the relation between the conditioned and the unconditioned. For the gradualist, the unconditioned is not in us. It's something we have to reach, attain. It's like another dimension we have to get into. For the suddenist, no, it's already there. We just have to uh, identify it and eliminate all the rubbish that covers this wonderful jewel, right? You know, Ajahn Chah was presented with this idea. Yes. He wasn't very impressed, despite the fact that it's quite uh, in line with yes. some of the yes. yes. And he said, if I was to take this glass and dip it in cow dung, would I say the glass is perfectly pure, it's just covered in cow dung? Yeah, you would say that. <laughs> yeah, it is covered in cow dung. No, but, yes, but it's nature. Yes. <laughs> exactly, the nature of it is pure, right? Okay, so Tantra, and remember by Tantra, there are several gradations of Tantra. I will talk a little bit next time about the different levels of Tantra, but basically what we're talking about is the highest level of Tantra, and the path that is taught by that highest level is called Vajrayana, right? The Vajra vehicle, the path of diamond. That's what we're talking about, and that 
Vajrayana is basically based on the idea that there is this kind of pure consciousness that exists in us and that the goal of practice is to be able to experience it, to immerse in it. And if we can immerse in it, then we are going to bypass a, a whole lot, long practice which has kind of stages by stage because at that point we will tap directly into uh, an already enlightened state of mind. So the whole goal of Tantra is to get us in touch with this pure consciousness. Right? That's why Contra Rinpoche says continuity. What does he mean by continuity? He means continuity of the cause, the path, and the fruit. Meaning the pure consciousness is present at the moment of the cause, meaning in the, or in the state of being an ordinary sentient being. Right? The path that continuity, that Tathagata Garbha, is also the path because the path is kind of plunging ourselves into that uh, already existing pure consciousness. And it is a result because once it's, all the defilements are gone, that's what enlightenment is about, right? So this is why Contra Rinpoche says, Continuity, Tantra is about continuity, or Vajrayana, I should say, is about continuity because it's all about getting into this already enlightened consciousness in a way that is controlled and conscious so as to uh, bypass eons of practice and get very quickly into enlightenment in one lifetime. That's the idea. Okay? <laughs> uh, let me make sure I don't miss a step. Okay, yeah. So, the question where to find this pure consciousness, right? this already enlightened consciousness. Okay? So, where you may think you find it is some kind of extremely refined product of culture, some kind of, kind of pure contemplation or something like that. That's not at all the idea of Tantra. Where you find this pure consciousness, it's at, I would say, the lowest level the organic level. So where do you find it? Well, maybe in deep sleep, maybe in uh, some strong emotions such as fear, uh, such as disgust, or in orgasm. That's where you find this already enlightened consciousness because in those states there is just pure consciousness. There is nothing, there is no subject, no object, no defilement, nothing. There is just this pure clarity, this pure presence to oneself and that's consciousness in its, if you want to say pure state, it's also consciousness in its lowest state, right? And that's where you find the enlightened consciousness, or the pure consciousness, at the lowest in the garbage, not on the highest shelf of the library, but in what we consider dirty, uh, marginal, uh, not to be talked about, all these things, most basic level, uh, of uh, human existence, the organic level, that's where you're going to find this pure consciousness. 
that's Tantra. So Tantra is going to be weird stuff because it deals with weird stuff, weird uh, part of human existence. And that's it's why it's often been uh, marginalized and rejected as being uh, uh, not uh, proper and so on. But that's what is uh, Tantra is trying to do. Yes? Do you find pure consciousness in the newborn infant? Presumably, yes. Maybe even before being born. But here is the important thing to understand. Uh, orgasm is a form of pure consciousness. But unless you are able to enter it in a controlled way, that's not going to do anything well for you. Otherwise, all the farangs in Nana and <laughs> Soy Cowboy would have been long enlightened, right? So clearly, orgasm by itself does nothing for you. But if you're able to enter it into a controlled way, then you're able to get in touch with a pure aspect, an undefiled aspect of human consciousness. Similarly, uh, if you sneeze, there is a one moment in which your mind is like completely shattered and blank. Okay? I have sneezed many times. Believe me, I'm not enlightened. <laughs> there is a sutta where someone asks the Buddha if a baby has pure consciousness. Yeah. And he says, no, it has latent tendencies. Yeah. That would be a kind of gradualist. In Kundalini Yoga, mm. we have the sneezing mm. Buddha meditation. Yeah. So. <laughs> Can you demonstrate? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, uh, so now you start to understand what I talked about the first time, which is how Tantra uh, is emphasized uh, the uh, usage of passions, of uh, sense pleasures, of sexuality, all these things that I talk about maybe start to make sense because for Tantra that's a way if it's done control, in a controlled way, that's a way to f get in touch, immersed into this kind of pure consciousness. So yes? Another question. So I, I was thinking that Tantra meant, the practice of Tantra would be the removal of defilements. No. This is not what no. it like. That's not what it sounds like because you haven't heard the full story. Oh. So, <laughs> yes. No, no. Yes? Question yeah, okay, so wait until a little bit because it's, it's actually much cooler than that. But you're emphasizing that at that level that you just mentioned. Yes. This is just like a, the first in introduction, it's not like... Well, uh, we're going to, yes. I'm just think, uh, trying to make clear what Tantra is about, right? And by Tantra we mean the highest. Uh, tantras. Now, <laughs> doing that is not easy, okay? Because uh, using passions to identify pure consciousness is not easy because passions are so strong and they carry us away and so uh, it's, it's not easy at all to do that. And so there are two uh, very important uh, aspects that uh, have to be kept in mind that are going to help us to understand what's going on. One is a preparation. In order to do this, you need a strong preparation, the Lamrim that I talked about at length last time, and also Tantra has some very specific preparatory practices called Nundro. And so, uh, various traditions have different kind of preparatory practices, but they all practice of purification. A typical example is you have to do 100,000 prostration, 100,000 guru yoga, uh, 100,000 mandala, 
uh, 100,000 refuge, so you can put refuge and prostration together. That's a fairly typical. So this is quite strenuous. 100,000 prostration is actually a really strenuous practice. And this is what teachers require you to do often, not always, in order to receive a tantric teaching. So one thing very important is the preparation. Okay? One thing. Second thing, and that's particularity of Tantra, is the body, embodiment. Okay? In Tantra, <laughs> mind is always understood to relate to, and call it energy, Tibetan call it wind, in Sanskrit it's Vayu, uh, it's as pretty much the, the equivalent, Buddhist equivalent of the Hindu idea of prana, or probably related also to the idea of qi, right, in Chinese medicine. So the idea of Tantra is that mind is always related to certain forms of energy. And so the Tantric practice is going to use this energy in order to eliminate the defilements, to bypass completely the defilement in order to plunge right in the pure consciousness. So it's not an idea of kind of progressively eliminating defilement, it's an idea of kind of forcefully. Suddenly. Forcefully, not suddenly, forcefully eliminating all the uh, superficial forms of consciousness to be plunged directly into uh, primordial consciousness, uh, continuity, uh, the mind itself, bodhicitta, this has many different names, but it's always the same idea, the mind of clear light. It's this pure consciousness devoid of any duality, which is uh, and uh, Tantra argues at the basis of human consciousness and which you can uh, get into by destroying all the other mental states. How you do it? By uh, controlling all the uh, energy, the different levels of energy of the body. That's where you have this idea of Nadi, channels in which the wind energy flows. These nadis intersect in various places which are called chakras. And the idea is to be, uh, a lot of tantric practice is about purifying this kind of tantric anatomy by totally making the flow of uh, energy free-flowing and merging all the energy into the heart center. Okay? If you are able to do so, then you are able to enter into this state of pure consciousness in a completely controlled fashion. So it's not a question, this is why Tantra claims to be so fast, because it's not eliminating the impurities one by one, it's rather kind of bypassing them to enter this already enlightened consciousness and then I will have to go further and creating a new form of embodiment, which is where it gets pretty weird. <laughs> well, for you now, that's... That's going to be okay. Weird. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say it, but now. Okay. <laughs> so, yes? Uh, once you've done this, uh, like, forceful elimination, is that just a one off thing and then you're finished? No, it's, it, has, it has a number of. Uh, stages. That's when you do this is called the stage of completion. <coughs> and the stage of completion, please, uh, Brian. I'm not sure where, where it goes, but 
so. No, it's different. It's another. Yeah, but this is under this one. Is what no, it, both, uh, both, in both perspective, you have stage of completion because if you're Gelukpa, you have the same stage of completion. It's just chutzpah, but it's a chutzpah that works. Whereas if the enigma, you think no, it's not chutzpah. It's getting in touch with this pure consciousness. But the practice is pretty much the same. So all the uh, Vajrayana practice come in, in this stage of completion in which you use the body to the energies of the body to enter in a controlled and extended way into this kind of uh, pure state of consciousness. And the best way to do it would be, not the only way, but the best way to do it would be through sexual yoga, because in, in the orgasm, you ad naturally attain this pure consciousness. But it lasts only for one second, or two, three seconds. What's that? <laughs> yes. If you are able to control your wind's energy, you can remain in there for hours, right? Because what takes your mind out of the orgasm is the wind energy of the body. So if you have kind of killed all the wind energy and merged it into the central channel, there you are. There is nothing to move you out. Right? The central channel is two channels, right? There are three. Sorry, yeah, but there's... There's a central channel that comes down your spine. Yeah, and then there is two yeah. on either side. Yeah, and then there are uh, uh, 21 and 70,000 and so on. 72,000. 72,000, thank you. Yes. So the attention needs to be in this channel. Yes. All the wind energies need to be concentrated in this channel, and particularly here in the heart center where if you can move, uh, merge all the wind energy, then nothing moves. You're there. Okay? Because what moves you is the wind energy. If the wind energy has been completely controlled, you're there for as long as you want. Okay? So you start to understand, well, this is really weird, but it is according to what I've described, this idea of merging or experiencing this uh, pure consciousness in this kind of organic form of, uh, of mentality, right? This kind of lowest level of human consciousness, which is this where you need to find this kind of pure consciousness. Yes? What is the Kundalini it's, it's it's the Buddhist Tantra probably historically originates in Hinduism. So one uh, uh, Hindu tradition is relatively similar and it's called Kundalini Yoga. Now, what I do want to emphasize is that uh, what is important to understand is that Buddhist Tantra are Buddhist. They're not a form of Hindu practices taken into Buddhism, they go back to basically the fundamental uh, teaching of the Buddha, which is suffering and the end of suffering, that is the transition from the conditioned to the unconditioned, right? So Buddhist Tantra are Buddhists. They're not some form of Hindu practice that was incorporated, though historically the Hindu Tantra were probably the first. So, and it's possibly, it's possible, it, it's very hard to understand uh, what I'm talking in this course is the Tibetan view of Tantra. Uh, that's a quite already largely sanitized view of Tantra. It's a bit hard to understand how Tantra was really practiced in India 
your vis description of this yogi uh, going into cemeteries, having sex with 12 years old girls and so on. And you're like, well, w what's happening? Is this literal? Is it not literal? What's going on? And so on. So uh, it is not easy to understand uh, what Tantra was in India. And it's probably likely that there was a kind of tantric <laughs> milieu which had both Hindu and Buddhist practitioners who were kind in a kind of, I don't know, dialogue or exchange and so on. And that's probably how Tantra developed in India. What I am uh, giving you is what Tibetans got out of that. And remember, it went through this period in which Tibetans were trying to figure out how Sutra and Tantra fit together, right? And so Atisha was the person who started the solution, the sutra is the preparation, the tantra is the actual practice, and that's how it works, right? So this is the Tibetan view of tantra because the, what was happening really in India is often quite intriguing, right? Okay, so the stage of completion is uh, <laughs> the stage, uh, it's also called sometimes the natural uh, stage, because at that stage, uh, what we, uh, the practitioner is able to deal with the reality of his or her own body. So at that point, it's not just imagining that you're enlightened, it's actually experiencing through these yogas the uh, state of enlightenment. That's why it's called natural or uncontrived stage. Now, <laughs> there is one stage before, which is the development stage, which is a contrived stage. Now, <laughs> to understand why we need uh, the uh, stage of development, no, 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 don't. Uh, yes, yes. No, no, stage, uh, stage of completion. But I want to write development before. Okay, okay. I'm going back, then I will go again, I promise you. Okay? So, before the stage of completion, you need the stage of development. What is the stage of development? Is deity yoga. Is visualizing yourself as the enlightened deity existing in the middle of his or her mandala. Okay? This is called also the contrived stage, because at that stage, you're using your own imagination to see yourself as this enlightened deity. Now, you may think, why do you need to do that? And the reason you need to do that is the following. The goal of tantric Vajrayana practice is not to achieve liberation, not to achieve the nirvana of the arhat, but to achieve the enlightenment, the full enlightenment of the Buddha. Okay? That enlightenment has two aspects. The Dharmakaya, which is the mind of the Buddha, and the embodiment of the Buddha, the Rupakaya. Yeah, it's, it's. Rupakaya. Yeah. What, 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 what? Yes? Enlightenment body, physical form. Yeah, enlightened mind. Okay. So the goal here is not just to attain nirvana, the enlightenment of the arhat, is to attain the enlightenment 
of the Buddha. The enlightenment of the Buddha is the achievement of the complete ability to help others. Can I say manifest form? Yeah, manifest form, embodiment, okay. <laughs> so, why do you need that? Well, you need that in order to help others. The goal, remember the bodhicitta, the conventional bodhicitta, was the desire, the wish to help, to become enlightened for the sake of helping others, right? That's the bodhisattva uh, ideal, right? That's what we talked about last time. The bodhisattva is a person who seeks enlightenment for the sake of others. So, in order to see, to, to be enlightened for the sake of others, you need to be able to communicate with others. And therefore you need embodiment. So, what Tantra is seeking to achieve is the mind of the Buddha and the body of the Buddha. Okay? That's very important. That's why you need the stage of development. In the stage of development, you visualize yourself as having the body of the Buddha. Okay? Now you may wonder, well visualizing is not enough to get it and that's why I'm going to go back to the completion stage. But right now we are in the development stage, the stage where you practice Deity Yoga, right? You visualize yourself as one of the many Tantric Deities that, whose empowerment you have obtained. So, in order to successfully enter into Deity Yoga, you need an empowerment which empowers you to practice the Deity Yoga, to visualize yourself as a particular Deity. Could be the uh, Avalokiteshvara, it can be a much uh, uh, more kind of uh, uh, a tantric deity like Chakrasambhara, like Yamantaka, like Guya Samaj. It, there are many, many uh, deities. Remember what Tsongkhapa says, having mastered the path of the sutra, one enters the ocean of the tantras, meaning tantras are enormous because there are so many different practices. But the basis is always this deity yoga. And to, in order to have this Deity Yoga, you need an empowerment from your Guru. That empowerment takes place in a mandala, which is a symbolic representation of the universe of that enlightened Deity. Okay? In order to get the empowerment, you need the Lamrim and you need the Nondro. So, you realize when I said Tibetan Buddhism is complicated, I really meant it because there are many levels of practice. First you need the Lamrim, then you need the special preparation, the Nundro, then you need the empowerment. That's why you have Guru devotion which we talked about last time. Then you have the stage of development, then you have the stage of completion. One lifetime is not sufficient. So it's not so <laughs> What's that? It is gradual. It is quite gradual. On the contrary, you, you, maybe you want to say it's not as sudden as it sounds. That's what you meant. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That's, as you can see, sudden and gradual actually together, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, they, they always say that. They always, you know, Milarepa 
uh, when he goes to see, uh, after he has killed so many people, he goes, he, he realizes he's in real trouble, so he goes to find a guru, and the first guru he finds is a Nyingma teacher who teach him Dzogchen and tell him, uh, you just uh, enter this teaching, you go to sleep, and tomorrow you will be enlightened. Then tomorrow the Milarepa wakes up and uh, he says, I'm not enlightened. The, the guru says, yeah, yeah, no, you're such a person, I can, my teaching won't work for you. You need a much tougher, uh, a much tougher person to deal with you. That's why he goes to, to Marpa and Marpa gives him all kind of crap uh, for years and years. I do encourage you to read the Milarepa story. It is one of the best Buddhist stories around. <laughs> so, development, completion, empowerment, the preparation, that's all. Now we have all the Milarepa story. Yeah. Some people might not know the name. So. Yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. There are a couple of translation. Uh, the most recent one is by Andrew Quintman. And once uh, we have you, especially with next class, after next class, you will be totally in a great position to read this story and make complete sense of this story. Okay, everybody's on board? No question? Okay. So, deity yoga, very important. It's also very important for the practical success of Tantra. One of the reasons that Tantra was so successful in Tibet is that it gives practitioners an enormous ability to accomplish rituals, right? Uh, one of the Tantra is, it, this is, it's really weird, has two goals. They're called Siddhis, attainment. So there is the supramundane Siddhi, which is the attainment of Buddhahood. And then there are the mundane cities, which are all the activities. Supra mundane or supra mundane? Supra mundane, right? Supra. Mundane and mundane cities. Right. Yeah. And mundane. Now, mundane city are all the activities that the tantric practitioner can enter into. The activity, a peaceful activity, uh, as for example, uh, clearing disease, uh, increasing activity as increasing wealth, uh, forceful activity uh, uh, as in controlling spirit, and violent activity as in killing. All these rituals are available to the tantric practitioner who is, has a strong visualization of himself as a deity. In this position, that practitioner is able to enter in relation with all kinds of entities and control them. That's great for P. That's what you need if you have P, which really annoys you, and you need to call a person who has this strong kind of tantric practice and who can clear the whole thing uh, by doing one of the several activities uh, that the uh, tantric practitioner can do through deity yoga. Okay? So, the deity yoga, the stage of development, is very important. One of its importance is obviously uh, the ability that it gives the practitioner to do all kinds of rituals, uh, and that's obviously very important in the success of Tantra in Tibet. Especially, if you remember the first class, given the collapse of a central authority where everybody is basically left on their own device, uh, you, the ability to uh, protect yourself through basically black magic uh, becomes an interesting uh, advantage, and this is what you find 
in the Millerie Pant story. This is not the main purpose, obviously, of the deity yoga, but it is a strong uh, advantage. The main purpose is to prepare the creation of a new form of embodiment, the embodiment of the Buddha. So, how do you do that? Well, once you have a strong deity yoga, and by the way, deity yoga is a great way to uh, accomplish shamatha, one-pointedness. Uh, there are special methods in Tantra which helps you to increase uh, your strength of concentration. Once you are able to have a strong deity yoga, you can enter the completion stage. And the various yogas of the completion stage, for example, one of the six yogas of Naropa, and so on, which allows you to manipulate the uh, wind energy as I laid it out earlier, right? That's quite difficult to do. That's also quite dangerous because when you manipulate the energy, the wind energy of the body, many things can go wrong. So tantric practice is not to be entered without extremely, extremely careful and competent guidance because this is not for the faint, faint of heart, faint, yes, yes. You don't want to make a mistake. No, no, because if you make a mistake, your whole energetic system is completely messed up and that's not good. <coughs> yes? Uh, you like, uh, stage. Yeah. Um, I, I saw the, you know, Monks. What's that? I saw uh, like monks. Yes. Using uh, Vajra and Bell <coughs> many times. Yes. And also they are doing a lot of uh, mudra. Yes. Why are they doing those? The idea <laughs> behind the deity yoga is that you dissolve yourself, your, yourself and then out of the dissolution, you recreate a completely new body, okay? That new body starts from uh, letters, kind of root uh, seed syllables, which then get developed into more fully, full uh, forms. When you visualize yourself as, uh, as the deity, your body is the body of the deity, your speech, which um, is mantra, is the speech of the deity, and your uh, mind is the mind of the deity. Part of the doing uh, the deity yoga is a reproduction of what the deity does, and that's where you get all the mudras. So mudras, mantras, visualization is all part of this complete recreation of yourself as this complete new uh, embodiment. So can I say this is in imagination, right? Okay. Not in reality. Can I say the, uh, those uh, and the Mudra are kind of must? Kind of what? Must. We have to do. Well, if you do the deity yoga, you have to do uh, the mudra is actually a relatively small part. What is more important is the visualization and the mantra. That's really what is important. Now, one of the uh, advantage of Tantra, as I said, is that it allows the practitioner to, end, to do all kinds of rituals, which is why in Tibetan Buddhism, you have much less of a separation between uh, let's say, your worldly practitioner and the monastic practitioner, as you tend to have uh, often in Thailand, right? Often in Thailand, monks are not supposed to do certain ritual. In Tibet, because monks practice Tantra, they all uh, are able, or many are able, to do all the kind of rituals that is required in a traditional society.
okay? Which is why Tantra was so successful in Tibet, especially given the lack of a central authority and the fact that the fragmented nature of the society meant everybody was more or less on their own. So, you know, having great ritual power, that's really useful. Read the Milarepa story, you will see. Okay? <laughs> but, as I said, the obtention of worldly power is not what is the main, most important thing in deity yoga. What is most important in deity yoga is that it prepare the central stage of the completion stage. In the completion stage, a lot of work is going to be able, is going to try to be able to dissolve the winds, to control the wind and dissolve them in the central channel. Okay? And that is really difficult and takes repeated uh, practice for most people. One or two people might get it immediately, but 99.99% has to do it uh, gradually and slowly, even if they are quite gifted, uh, which you need to be in order to be at that stage. When you are able to enter into the uh, really subtle level of consciousness, you are in contact with this mind of enlightenment. And you are in a unique position to create a new body. And so, the practice, once you get into this stage, what is called stage of clear light, the real, uh, I don't know how you put it, the real absorption into this pure consciousness, you are in a position to recreate a new embodiment. So, when you get out of this stage, you create a new kind of body. That's called in various ways the rainbow body, the illusory body, there are various names in different tantra. They all aim at creating a new body. I remember Pachot Rinpoche talking about creating this rainbow body. Yes. But he has a Tibetan accent. And I thought he, he said Rambo body. <laughs> <laughs> it is a kind of Rambo body. Uh, this is a real body. Is it the manifest form or not? Well, it is going to lead to. It's no. the earliest uh, creation of a form of embodiment which is uh, going to lead to this manifest form. It is a real body. It is not this usual body. Hence, in Tantra it is said, you can reach full enlightenment in one lifetime, but not in one body. Because you need another body in order to become a Buddha. Okay? That body is made of the uh, wind energy that goes with consciousness. But that wind energy is kind of worked out through deity yoga. So what you're going to have is when you get out of this profound immersion into this pure consciousness, what you are going to be able to do is spontaneously arise as this new body which is going to have the form of the deity that you have meditated on for years and years. So now you start to understand why you need deity yoga, because these winds are not going to appear as this body spontaneously. Maybe one person in a thousand or a hundred thousand might be able to do it, but is going to need uh, uh, practice and training. And the practice and training is the deity yoga. And so once you're able to, in the completion stage, to reach this mind of clear light, this most 
kind of profound, most basic level of human consciousness in a conscious and controlled way, out of it, when you get out of it, you are going to be able to construct this new real body called variously illusory body, uh, rainbow body, and so on. That body is like an astral body or it's like a, a, a dream body. Uh, I had a, a friend who came to see the Dalai Lama uh, many years ago and I went to translate for him. And the Dalai Lama asked him, asked my friend, do you go places in dreams? And my friend said, yes. And I said to my friend, no, you don't understand what he's asking you. He's not asking you whether you're dreaming of going to places. He's asking you whether you're really going to places. And my friend said, yeah, that's exactly what I, I understood. And my answer is exactly the same. It is, yes, I am going to places in dreams. Now, I have personally never done that. I have no idea what it means. But this is the idea that is behind the, uh, this idea of a new tantric embodiment, this pure, this illusory body or this rainbow body, which is a, a creation of a new body, which prefigure indeed the manifest form of the Buddha. This can coexist with your physical body, presumably? Yes, uh, they say so. Uh, in the rainbow body, uh, you, what you have is the practitioner closes the door and then consumes completely his own or her own body and uh, you find nothing except the nails and hair, right? This is one of the Nyingma practice which is weird among the weird. It has many, many weird practices. It's a really interesting school. The illusory body, uh, you keep your body. Uh, it's not your main body anymore. It's a secondary body. Your main body is this new body of the deity which prefigure the uh, Rupakaya of the Buddha. So now you have this new person who is, who knows where you are, but you still have, uh, you're still able apparently to manipulate your old body and make it function uh, for a certain time. <coughs> Often in Tantra, uh, and I'm going to talk about this on class number five. Hi, oh, we're doing well. We're, uh, the privileged location for uh, finding this kind of deep state of mind and uh, creating this new body is what is called the bardo or intermediary stage. In the Abhidharma, in the Abhidharma literature, there are two views concerning rebirth. One that states that there is no intermediary state, and one that states there is an intermediary state. So the idea of bardo is not uh, creation of tantra, it goes back to the Abhidharma. Which Abhidharma? Sarvastivada. The Vaibhashika Abhidharma, there is an intermediary state. In the Theravada, as far as I know, there is no intermediary state. So Abhidharma literature concerned contains various views on whether there is an intermediary state or not between death and reincarnation. So in Tibetan Buddhism, obviously, there is an intermediary state. And often, people are going to use that intermediary state in order to get into this deep state of uh, pure consciousness and then arise in the bardo with this kind of new body. And this is what I will talk about in class number five. What I wanted to do here today is just give you an idea, not so much of how it's done, but what is the principles behind Tantra. And the principles are this idea of a kind of uh, 
pure consciousness together with this very important idea of consciousness being always connected with wind energy, with energy. And together, they are the basis of tantric practice and they are the basis of the obtention of the two Buddhas, the two Kayas of the Buddha, right? The wind energy is transformed into the, manif the manifest form, the Rupakaya, and the pure consciousness is uh, the Dharmakaya. That's what Tantra is all about. That's why I, I emphasize that this is a Buddhist teaching. This is not a Hindu teaching in Buddhist guise. This is a Buddhist teaching which goes back to the fundamental question of enlightenment. But obviously, to reach enlightenment, it has many, what I would call, weird aspects. And uh, for example, the obtention of this uh, illusory body is one of the weird things that. Can I just come up? This intermediary body, in the original Pali, there's a number of suttas that supported this. And then it was only 300 years later in the Katavatu uh -huh. where this argument yes. appears, which shows that people were arguing about exactly. it. Exactly. And then there came like the commentarial yeah. view that there isn't yeah. an intermediary body. Uh, intermediary state. Stage. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I will talk about that class five. Okay. But that's important because that's where you're going to get a special opportunity. Yes. For enlightenment, for enlightenment particularly with tantra. Now, I, I just there are people who. Okay, go ahead. I wanted to ask this uh, rainbow body. Again, in the Pali, we see that there's a body that can be sent and go to talk to different gods and yes. heavens and hells. Is that the rainbow body or not? Uh, well, that's a rain. The, the dream body of my friend was your kind of body, right? And that's a natural, that's a body made out of the wind the energy that goes together with the mind, right? Yeah, but there's a mind-made body that goes to visit different Yes, else, yes. Right? But it's worked through the deity yoga, and then it's worked through immersion into uh, pure consciousness, right? So it's not just the ordinary mind-made body, it's a mind-made body reworked through a very long practice in which it becomes a kind of the, the embodiment of the deity which arises out of this pure consciousness, right? Or rather out of the wind energy that supports this pure consciousness. So, the question I was going to ask, <coughs> you mentioned Dharmakaya. Yes. You haven't mentioned, you know, Manakaya or Sambhava. This is, yeah, this is two particular uh, mode of the Rupakaya. So you're saying Nirmanakaya is what exactly? Nirmanakaya, Rupakaya, <laughs> in, in, in Sutra Mahayana, mm -hmm. that's where the concept comes from. So why are there two words? Okay, I, I, I will explain. Okay. But one thing to understand, the important difference is not between Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya, it's between Rupakaya and Dharmakaya. That's the important difference. That's what's fundamental to Mayana practice. The Sambhogakaya is the manifestation of the Buddha which is available only to high bodhisattvas. Because in Sutra Mahayana, in order to become a Buddha, you cannot become a Buddha as a human being. You need to be reborn, I think it's Akanista, into a kind of pure realm in which you have this kind of illusory body and then you can become a Buddha. That realm is only available to high bodhisattva and that's when you become enlightened, you become enlightened in the sam as a Sambhogakaya. And then you have the power, the possibility of manifesting yourself 
to people who are not able to go to a canista, like people like me. And this is the Nirmanakaya. The Nirmanakaya is the ordinary manifestation of Buddhahood available to ordinary sentient beings. The Sambhogakaya is a manifestation of Buddhahood which is only available to high beings. Now, in classical Mahayana, this is an important distinction because enlightenment cannot happen here, right? It has to happen over there. And it happens after three incalculable eons, so we have time. <laughs> in Tantra, enlightenment happened here, not in this body, but here. So the distinction between Nirmanakaya and Sambhogakaya is less important in Tantra. The fundamental distinction is between the Rupakaya and the Dharmakaya, because in order for the Dharmakaya to help sentient beings, it needs to have a way to manifest itself, to communicate, and therefore it needs embodiment. That's what's so important to understand, to understand what Tantra is about, to understand that it's not seeking to accomplish just the enlightenment of the Arhat, but it is seeking this incredibly uh, ambitious goal of becoming the fully enlightened Buddha who has both the manifest form and with, as well as the enlightenment. That's fundamental to Tantra. That's what's really important in order to understand why, what is Tantra and why it is different from certain other practices because it's this emphasis on embodiment, right? That's really important. Yes, behind. Intermediary rainbow body, we didn't talk about that. Or, so is that, okay, that's one question then. Is that the same thing, the intermediary stage? No, intermediary stage is what happens once you die, before you get reborn. It has nothing to do with that stage. No, it's just a great opportunity to, to create, to develop this rainbow body, but it's not, it has nothing to do with it. And we'll talk about it class number five, where I will talk about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So then, uh, my question the rainbow body is what you get out of uh, getting into the mind of clear light, right? And at that stage, do you already have both Dharmakaya and Rupakaya or not? You don't have the... You have the Dharmakaya because uh, in our interpretation, we took a suddenist perspective. So you have the Dharmakaya, I have the Dharmakaya. It's hard to believe that I have it, but I do have it. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing with it, probably not <laughs> such deep, a group. Deep down. Yeah, deep, deep down, exactly. Yeah. Deep, 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 deep down. But I have it, and you have it as well. The Rupakaya. You don't have it, I don't have Well, you probably don't have it, but I don't know. I don't have it, okay? Because in order to be able to have the Rupakaya, you need to be able to get into this mind of, uh, this mind of clear light, then get out of it, create this illusory body, this is called the impure illusory body. Then you go into more practice, you create the pure illusory body, and you still have some way to go until full enlightenment. So what you, I have, and what you probably have, is the basis for the Rupakaya, which is the wind energy that goes together with any state of consciousness. That we certainly have. But we don't have, or I don't have, the Rupakaya because the Rupakaya is this completely purified form of embodiment that is uh, arising only after this quite long, ar arduous practice, right? Right, so the rainbow body is before the full Rupakaya. Yeah, the rainbow body is like the illusory body. It's, you're, you're pretty high there, believe me. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're pretty far gone, yes. 
Once you have even the impure illusory body, you, you don't need a lot, a lot more. You, you're, you're pra quite almost there. Yes. About deity yoga. Who chooses the deity? Is it the guru or the disciple? And my last part of the question is that one of the deities? What? Is that one of the deities we're talking about? This? No. This is a wheel of the life of life. If we had PowerPoint, I could show you many. Uh, tantric deity, but if you Google tantric deities, you will see there are hundreds, thousands of them. So who chooses the deity you will? Uh, well, ideally, uh, tantric practice is to be under, undertaken privately, and so you have a one-to-one -one relation with a guru who chooses a deity and gives you the empowerment. The practice is not quite like this because many people want to have empowerment. So you have these uh, big sessions where hundreds, even thousands of people get empowerment and that's how it works. Just yeah. to mention, we can't provide it. Uh, okay. Well, if you want to see what a deity yoga, what a deity looks like, Google tantric deities, you will see uh, is these quite far out forms. I, yeah. I heard that the Dalai Lama was giving out these empowerments. Yes. Before he was doing the retreat, and people would come, get the empowerment, and then bugger off. <laughs> and then, so he started doing the empowerment at the end of the retreat. But after a couple of years, people were skipping the whole practice at the beginning and then just coming at the very end. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the retreat, it's the preparation, like the lamrim and so on. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the tantric theory, I'm coming to your question, just a second. The tantric theory is that only bodhisattvas should receive empowerment. The Tibetan practice is basically, tantra is wide open. Certain now, what is not wide open is the actual practices, for example, on the completion stage. That's actually quite secret because that actually could be quite dangerous. So that's really kept quite carefully, but empowerment are given quite generously by Tibetan teachers. And for example, certain forms of empowerment like the Kalachakra Tantra, which is supposed to be the highest Tantra, is given to everybody, maybe even dogs and cats. <laughs> yes? I wondered if you want to talk a bit more about the dangers of that felt. Well, the dangers is basically that you're dealing in the completion stage. Uh, okay, there is the development stage and some people are good at visualization, and some people like myself are terrible at visualization. So that's already a problem, for example, for me. I cannot visualize to save my life. But I'm not the only one. I know, for example, a uh, quite good uh, Tibetan Lama. They were asking him, well, how is your uh, visualization? And basically he was drawing something like that. That was the deity. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another person was interviewing, uh, uh, who was that? Not Sonia Rinpoche, his brother, I forgot his name. And they were asking him his visualization and they were assuming that he's good at visualizing because, you know, he's, he's a Tibetan meditator, but not all Tibetan meditators are necessarily good at that. So this is one kind of problem. Together with that development stage is not good at the visualization like me. It's actually really hard and it makes for a lot of tension and difficulties. So this is one difficulty. The real dangers are here, the level of completion, because there you're working with the energies of your body. And if when you dissolve all this energy, you're not doing it properly, then really bad things can happen. Yes. I can confirm that. Yeah. So uh, this is, the, I mean, people who do Kundalini Yoga are probably aware of, the, 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 of related dangers. And that's certainly something that in the Tibetan tradition uh, requires very great care and to be taught 
by people who have experience and know this stuff really well. I would never dream of touching this kind of stuff. That's why next time we'll talk about Dzogchen and Mahamudra, right? Yes. Uh, Arthur. No. Oh, no question. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. From my understanding, one must have a glimpse of emptiness before yes. starting uh, yoga. And from this basis, uh, the term visualization and imagination actually doesn't fit into the context. Doesn't fit what? Uh, visualization is means like you are visualizing, you're creating. Imagine is like you imagine something that is not there. Well, that's remember the difference between gradual versus sudden perspective. Um, if you ask Enigma, teacher will say, no, it's, you're already enlightened. So what you're visualizing is actually who you really are. A Gelug would say, really? You don't know shit, so how can you be enlightened? <laughs> That's why I don't like the Nigma formulation, which is that you're already enlightened. I think um, it's better to say that the idea is that there is an already enlightened aspect of your personality. That's really what, is, what it is about, right? The Gelug don't believe in that. And so for them, this is just chutzpah, but it's, as I said, it's a chutzpah that works. And that's what, all what you need, right? Dharma is skillful means to reach uh, the ultimate. And why not have these really bizarre practices of the Tantra? But the Tantra themselves definitely take this suddenist perspective. Now, uh, I will come back to you. Uh, you're quite right. When you visualize yourself, you need to start from a kind of uh, deconstructing your sense of I and start all over again. So you do need that kind of understanding. How you get that kind of understanding is worked differently in different traditions, but definitely in order to recreate yourself, you have to start from the point at which you are not your ordinary self, in which this ordinary self has been completely exploded. And then you recreate yourself from seed syllables into deities, and then deities inhabiting uh, mandala, and so on. So it goes down and out. But it is an exorcist in imagination. It is an exorcist in visualization. That's not what you see. That's what you visualize. And when people get, develop this really strong sense of being the deity, so for example, suppose a deity has big horns, and some people would go like, 